influence. Thousands who have not an experimental knowledge of Christ will be led to accept the forms of godliness without the power. Such a religion is just what the multitudes desire. The church's claim to the right to pardon leads the Romanists to feel at liberty to sin, and the ordinance of confession without which her pardon is not granted tends also to give license to evil. He who kneels before fallen man and opens in confession the secret thoughts and imaginations of his heart is debasing his manhood and degrading every noble instinct of his soul. In unfolding the sins of his life to a priest, an erring, sinful mortal, and too often corrupted with wine and licentiousness, his standard of character is lowered, and he is defiled in consequence. His thought of God is degraded to the likeness of fallen humanity, for the priest stands as a representative of God. This degrading confession of man to man is the secret spring from which has flowed much of the evil that is defiling the world and fitting it for the final destruction. Yet to him who loves self-indulgence, it is more pleasing to confess to a fellow mortal than to open the soul to God. It is more palatable to human nature to do penance than to renounce sin. It is easier to mortify the flesh by sackcloth and nettles and galling chains than to crucify fleshly lusts. Heavy is the yoke which the carnal heart is willing to bear rather than bow to the yoke of Christ. There is a striking similarity between the Church of Rome and the Jewish Church at the time of Christ's first advent. While the Jews secretly trampled upon every principle of the law of God, they were outwardly rigorous in the observance of its precepts, loading it down with exactions and traditions that made obedience painful and burdensome. As the Jews professed to revere the law, so do Romanists claim to reverence the cross. They exalt the symbol of Christ's sufferings, while in their lives they deny him whom it represents. Papists place crosses upon their churches, upon their altars, and upon their garments. Everywhere is seen the insignia of the cross. Everywhere it is outwardly honored and exalted. But the teachings of Christ are buried beneath a mass of senseless traditions, false interpretations, and rigorous exactions. The Savior's words concerning the bigoted Jews apply with still greater force to the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Matthew 23, 4. Conscientious souls are kept in constant terror, fearing the wrath of an offended God, while many of the dignitaries of the Church are living in luxury and sensual pleasure. The worship of images and relics, the invocation of saints, and the exaltation of the Pope are devices of Satan to attract the minds of the people from God and from his Son. To accomplish their ruin, he endeavors to turn their attention from him through whom alone they can find salvation. He will direct them to any object that can be substituted for the one who has said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11:28. It is Satan's constant effort to misrepresent the character of God, the nature of sin, and the real issues at stake in the great controversy. His sophistry lessens the obligation of the divine law and gives men license to sin. At the same time, he causes them to cherish false conceptions of God so that they regard him with fear and hate rather than with love. The cruelty inherent in his own character is attributed to the Creator. It is embodied in systems of religion and expressed in modes of worship. Thus the minds of men are blinded, and Satan secures them as his agents to war against God. By perverted conceptions of the divine attributes, heathen nations were led to believe human sacrifices necessary to secure the favor of deity and horrible cruelties have been perpetrated under the various forms of idolatry. The Roman Catholic Church, uniting the forms of paganism and Christianity, and like paganism misrepresenting the character of God, has resorted to practices no less cruel and revolting. In the days of Rome's supremacy, there were instruments of torture to compel assent to her doctrines. There was the stake for those who would not concede to her claims. There were massacres on a scale that will never be known until revealed in the judgment. Dignitaries of the church studied under Satan their master to invent means to cause the greatest possible torture and not end the life of the victim. 
In many cases, the infernal process was repeated to the utmost limit of human endurance until nature gave up the struggle and the sufferer hailed death as a sweet release. Such was the fate of Rome's opponents. For her adherents, she had the discipline of the scourge, of famishing hunger, of bodily austerities in every conceivable heart-sickening form. To secure the favor of heaven, penitents violated the laws of God by violating the laws of nature. They were taught to sunder the ties which he has formed to bless and gladden man's earthly sojourn. The churchyard contains millions of victims who spent their lives in vain endeavors to subdue their natural affections, to repress as offensive to God every thought and feeling of sympathy with their fellow creatures. If we desire to understand the determined cruelty of Satan manifested for hundreds of years, not among those who never heard of God, but in the very heart and throughout the extent of Christendom, we have only to look at the history of Romanism. Through this mammoth system of deception, the prince of evil achieves his purpose of bringing dishonor to God and wretchedness to man. And as we see how he succeeds in disguising himself and accomplishing his work through the leaders of the church, we may better understand why he has so great antipathy to the Bible. If that book is read, the mercy and love of God will be revealed. It will be seen that he lays upon men none of these heavy burdens. All that he asks is a broken and contrite heart, a humble, obedient spirit. Christ gives no example in his life for men and women to shut themselves in monasteries in order to become fitted for heaven. He has never taught that love and sympathy must be repressed. The Savior's heart overflowed with love. The nearer man approaches to moral perfection, the keener are his sensibilities, the more acute is his perception of sin, and the deeper his sympathy for the afflicted. The Pope claims to be the Vicar of Christ, but how does his character bear comparison with that of our Savior? Was Christ ever known to consign men to the prison or the rack because they did not pay him homage as the King of Heaven? Was his voice heard condemning to death those who did not accept him? When he was slighted by the people of a Samaritan village, the Apostle John was filled with indignation and inquired, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Jesus looked with pity upon his disciple and rebuked his harsh spirit, saying, The Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, Luke 9, 54 and 56. How different from the spirit manifested by Christ is that of his professed vicar. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation when men of God stood up at the peril of their lives to expose her iniquity. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be, the apostasy of the latter times, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose, but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. Faith ought not to be kept with heretics, nor persons suspected of heresy, L'Enfant, Volume 1, page 516. She declares, 